So the Lord's Prayer. I wonder if somebody um, came up to you and said, teach me how to pray. You're a Christian, you go to church, teach me how to pray. I, I wonder what your response would be. Well, here we have Jesus' response, and it's all of 38 words. And of course, thousands of books have been written over the years, over the centuries. Thousands of books have been written about prayer. Gallons of ink have been spilled about the topic of prayer, mainly, I must say, by introverts. I wish a few more extroverts would uh, write stuff about prayer. I think it would be very different, much more exciting. Um, so all of these books and Jesus' reply to this question, teach me how to pray, is 38 words. Short enough for a tweet. So, you know, if Twitter had been around in Jesus' day, he would have got away with tweeting this. It's so short and it's so simple. So I, I do want to kind of be faithful to the, the spirit of that brevity of Jesus in what I say today. But I do want to unpack uh, a little bit this version of the Lord's Prayer that we find in Luke. So it might be worth you um, opening a Bible, if you can find a Bible near you. I've only got the, I've only got the uh, large print page reference, which is 1624. If somebody could shout out the smaller Bible page reference, that would be really good. Don't all shout at once. Well done, Linda. 77. Thank you. Okay. The first word, Father. Now that's interesting. That's an interesting start. Because I don't know about you. Because so often in my prayers, I go straight in to whatever the particular need is. Or I go in with whatever I want, or whatever the emergency is, or whatever the crisis is. I go straight in, help. But no, Jesus says, begin by thinking about who you're praying to. You're praying to Father. Einstein once said, um, there is a basic question facing all of us as we look at the universe. And boy, haven't we had some wonderful new glimpses of the universe uh, through that new telescope? Absolutely wonderful, wonderful images. Uh, but Einstein said, there is a basic question facing each and every one of us. And the question is this, uh, is the universe friendly? Is the universe friendly? To which Jesus replies absolutely unequivocally, yes, the universe is friendly. But the universe is more than friendly. God isn't just a friend whose arm you might twist to get your way, uh, as in the funny little parable that he goes on to tell um, after, after the Lord's Prayer. No, God is Father. God is Mother. God is a loving parent who will do anything for their children. I know there are a few exceptions uh, as we think about earthly parents, but on the whole, and very conscious that my mother is sitting here this morning, on the whole, uh, parents will do anything for their children. And Jesus says, that's, that's who you're praying to when you pray. You pray, you're praying to father, you're praying to mother, you're praying to a loving parent. And it's really important to get that in our heads and hearts before we go any further in our prayers. So actually, Jesus is kind of saying, start with some theology. Start with some thinking and some reflecting on who you're praying to, or rather, who you're praying with. Because as we read the rest of the Gospels and the New Testament, it's clear that, that God isn't just this distant being that we're praying to. No, God, as Jesus says at the end of our reading, God sends his Holy Spirit, whereby God is praying with us and God is praying in us. So think about who you're praying to, Jesus says. Think about who you're praying with before you do anything else. Father, 
Hallowed be your name. Praise. How much do you praise God in your prayers? How much do I praise God in my prayers? Again, before I do anything else, And again, you you may be inspired by various things. You might be inspired by a lovely walk in nature. I do do most of my praying, and I'm happiest praying outside when I'm walking. Um, I'm rubbish sitting in a room. (laughs) Um, I'm I'm not so bad in church when there's other people around, because you encourage me. But yeah, all kinds of things will inspire you. Different things will inspire you in your prayers. Again, those beautiful images of the universe that we've seen in the news recently that remind us of what an awesome and a beautiful and a loving uh, intelligence is behind all of this. And it's about having that spirit of awe, that spirit of praise. Again, before we do anything else, making sure we're, we're praising God for who God is, that beautiful, loving parent who has created pretty much everything we see around us. So praise, that's why we have praise in our times together, when we come together. There's always an element of of praise and worship, and that's really, really important. Okay, next phrase, your kingdom come. This is absolutely core, isn't it, to Jesus' teaching. Jesus preached about the kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven over and over and over again. There's a new kingdom he he preached. There's a new kingdom that I want to establish. It's not like the kingdoms of this world who so often rule by power and by coercion. This is a different kingdom. This is a kingdom of justice and joy and mercy and compassion and above all, love. This is the kingdom that we want to come. And thank God there's another kingdom, to be honest. Um, Who's fed up already with the the Tory leadership race? Yeah, a few hands. Honestly, I I couldn't believe it. Monday and Tuesday, you know, whilst whilst we have record temperatures here, while swathes of Europe are on fire, hardly a mention of climate change. Barely a mention. And uh, apparently there may well have been some very heavy lobbying and even donations to the Conservative Party not to mention climate change by some accounts. We can do better. We can do so much better. You know, oh, 20 years' time, you know, the planet's burning, but at least I'm paying 19p in the pound tax. Come on, let's get our priorities right. We need to pray for our politicians. We need to pray for our leaders. We need to pray that they have the priorities and the values of the kingdom. But it's not just them out there, it's us. So Jesus is saying, we need to pray, your kingdom come. Your kingdom come in my life. That kingdom of justice and joy and mercy and compassion and love that is so different from those earthly kingdoms and earthly rulers. May that kingdom come in my life. So we're saying to God, your agenda, your agenda, not mine. So notice, we still haven't, we still haven't said anything about what we want or any kind of need or distress or emergency. Nothing yet. It's all God-centered. And, and the importance is we, we are, we're like a planet revolving around the sun, um, Because sometimes in our prayers, I think, we can have the old-fashioned view that somehow the sun revolves around us. You know, God revolves around us. God revolves around our prayers. No, your kingdom come, not mine. Your kingdom, your priorities, your values come in my life. Give us each day our daily bread. I don't know whether you've ever noticed that rather awkward repetition Give us each day our daily bread. Is is Jesus trying to tell us something here? Um, And we know he's teaching elsewhere, don't we? You know, just concentrate on the day ahead of you. Don't be anxious about the future. Now, of course, we have to plan for the future. but, But don't be anxious about the future. Don't be anxious. Don't fret about things that you can't change in the future. Just concentrate on the day. 
and concentrate on the fact that your loving God will provide everything you need for each day. One day at a time, sweet Jesus. I won't sing it. Um, it's that kind of idea. Just, just pray day by day. Pray for what you need, our daily bread. Bread is a very basic thing. And it's something that we need to live. Pray for what you need, Jesus is saying. Don't pray for what you want. You know, you can pray for a Ferrari. You can pray to win the national lottery. But, but don't be disappointed if your prayers aren't, aren't answered. But pray for what you need and God will provide. Now, I'm very, very conscious that there are God knows how many people who today, even that prayer is not being answered. Um, and one of the reasons why that prayer is not being answered is Russia. It's, it's the war in Ukraine. It's the fact that grain can't get out of the country. And all our hopes got up, didn't they, when, when that treaty was signed to get some grain out to um, all these struggling countries that, that, that rely so much on grain from Ukraine. And then Russia goes and causes mischief in, in all the ports on the Black Sea. So this is an example of one of those kingdoms working against the kingdom of God. And so the result is, is something very different. It's, it's not people being fed, it's, it's, it's people being starved. And again, it's, it's something we need to pray about. And Jesus tells us to pray. Give us each day our daily bread. We need to pray that for ourselves. There's going to be more and more people praying that as we go through the year. We may be people not just the other side of the world, but in our own lives who won't be able to feed themselves. And so this is where maybe we need to be the answer to our prayer. We need to be the answer to our Lord's prayer. And I think one of the most fantastic things the church is doing is, is kind of how on top of it is with, with food banks and other models um, of, of gross, uh, grocery stores and that kind of thing. Give us each day our daily bread. Ask God for what you need day by day. And he will provide. Often through other people, but he will provide. And forgive us our sins. Now that's interesting. That's quite late on in the prayer. So we're now in confession time. Isn't it interesting, in the modern service, in the modern communion service that we follow, confession's right at the beginning. I don't think that's the right place. When I grew up with the uh, ASB, um, the, 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 the previous prayer book, and those of you who come to the 8 o'clock, you'll know that the confession came halfway through the service. It came after the sermon. It came after the readings and the sermon. So once we'd had time to reflect on God's priorities, it's then that we confess. And so it's interesting that we have a similar possession, uh, possession, position here. Forgive us our sins. So at this point, now we have presented our need at last. We have made our petition. We've made our request to God. We're mindful of that privilege of being able to do that because we are weak, we are frail, we make wrong choices, we make mistakes. And it's about being honest before God about our frailty that sometimes trips us up and that sometimes makes us make messes in our lives and in the world. Sometimes the very messes that we are praying about when we come to God and saying there's a mess and God is kind of saying, well, are you partly responsible? So that's why it's important that at this point there's confession. Forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And those two phrases are inextricably linked. You can't have one like the other. It's like an equation. And of course, Jesus teaches all kinds of colorful stories, doesn't he, about the, the absolute ridiculousness of receiving forgiveness from God, but not forgiving other people. So he tells those wonderful stories, doesn't he, of you know, people who kind of, you know, they owe a million quid and they get let off the debt. And then they go out and kind of beat somebody up because they owe them kind of 50p or whatever. It's, uh, it's just crazy. Forgiveness, of course, was again a, a core message of Christ's teaching. But Christ didn't just 
teach about forgiveness. He achieved that forgiveness for us. As uh, we were reminded in our first reading, well done, Alan, for making uh, Paul or whoever wrote Colossians comprehensible. It's not easy to read those letters. Um, He used that very graphic image of the law being nailed to the cross. When Jesus went to the cross, the law, with all of its old demands, the law that said, you know, you you owe something to God. You're You're... continually indebted to God. That law was nailed to the cross. The price was paid. Everything was accounted for. Everything was paid. That's the forgiveness that Christ offers on the cross. And we can claim that every day of our lives as long as, as long as we're mindful of our own relationships and where we've made messes where maybe we're holding grudges against other people. We need, we need to forgive. There's there's, there's that divine imperative. Otherwise, we, there's no point praying any further. In fact, there's no point praying any of the Lord's Prayer. Final phrase, do not bring us to the time of trial. Do not bring us to the time of trial. Now, this is a really interesting one. You know that we usually pray, do not lead us into temptation. Well, sorry, folks, that's probably not what was in the original. Yes, there are versions of Luke's Lord's Prayer and Matthew's Lord's Prayer that do say, do not lead us into temptation. But most of them will say something like, do not bring us to the time of trial. So don't blame me. Write to the Church of England. Write to the Liturgical Commission. Can we please be praying the right version of the Lord's Prayer? Do not bring us to the time of trial. Really interesting. What's Jesus saying here? I think he's saying it's okay to pray for a quiet life. It's okay to pray for a peaceful life. It's okay to pray that you will never be persecuted. It's okay to pray that you will never be discriminated against or mistreated because of your faith. It's okay to pray that. And again, I mean, I could bring out examples, but our prayer book, the Anglican prayer books, particularly, uh, again, the, the, the older ones, are full of prayers that are on this theme, just praying for peace, praying for a quiet life, praying again for the government, that we would be, quote, godly and quietly governed. There's nothing wrong praying for a quiet life. Nothing wrong at all. But of course, the most awesome thing about this is that the person person telling us to pray, do not bring us to the time of trial, was brought to the time of trial. He prayed that prayer himself. He prayed that prayer in Gethsemane. Take this cup away from me. I don't want to go through it. Through with it. And that prayer was not answered. So if your prayers are not answered, you're in good company. Jesus' prayers were not always answered. He was brought to the time of trial. But God doesn't want kind of unnecessary martyrs. You know, don't go out looking for trouble. Don't go out looking for persecution. I think that's what Jesus is saying here. Pray for a quiet life. Because because when there's quietness, when there's order, when there's peace, the good news can spread much quicker, as it did through the Roman Empire because of the relative order and peace and harmony that that empire, very cruel though it was, brought to that part of the world. And that's why Paul says pray for for the rulers and pray for a peaceful existence so that the good news may spread. So good news, folks. It's okay to pray for a quiet life. I like that bit, and I wish we would pray it together. Uh, rather than temptation. Why are we praying about temptation? We've just prayed about forgiveness. Doesn't make sense to me anyway. I might be preaching complete heresy, in which case, you know, write to the bishop about me. Um, but I think I've got the Bible, and I've got recent, the most recent Bible scholarship on my side. So there you go. I've rabbited on far, far too much. I've, I've said much more than 38 words. But again, it's just so brief, so beautiful. But everything is there. Everything is there that we need. Maybe a bit of homework for us in this coming week. However you pray, 
whatever your normal way of praying is, make the Lord's Prayer more of, of, your, of your prayer time. And maybe use Luke's version or use Matthew's version, which is slightly longer. Um, use the one that's in the Gospels. Um, you might like to kind of journey through it through your day. So don't pray it all at once. I mean, it, it's not really designed just to be prayed as a prayer, although just praying the words is very powerful. I know that as a chaplain. I know that when I'm praying the Lord's Prayer with somebody in the corner of the bay, I know that everybody else is listening, and it doesn't matter what their faith is. And uh, they, I often get amens from the other people in the bay, and sometimes the staff as well. This is powerful, powerful stuff, just to say the words. But, but more, that, more than that, I think, the, I think the Lord's Prayer, and I think Jesus' response here, is about a whole framework. He's giving us a whole framework for every day, a kind of a journey of prayer for us to journey through every day of our lives. And everything is there. Theology, uh, praise, um, intercession, provision, forgiveness, reconciliation praying against persecution. Everything, everything is there. And I end with the words of our current Archbishop of York, Stephen Cottrell. Daily provision. Penitent hearts. The grace to forgive others. God's rule of justice and peace breaking upon the world. Saying this prayer starts a revolution because it puts God first. And that's not usually the case. But this is all we will ever need to pray. And it will change us. Amen.